Coming up on episode 24 of the Art Podcast, we reconnect with the first ever guest of the Art Podcast, Ihue Sia. Ihue tells us about his journey since becoming a software engineer at our studio, how he maintains balance among his work and personal responsibilities, and his vision for how blog down and book down could lead to a streamlined publishing workflow. I hope you enjoy this episode, but I have one question for you. Are you ready? Welcome to the R Podcast. My name is Eric Nance, and thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. I have a very exciting interview to share with you in a few minutes, where we sit down with our first ever guest of the R Podcast, Iwe Sia. And I want to play that interview for you shortly. But first, I wanted to touch on something that we will be talking about a bit during the interview, but more about my application of the technology of Blogdown. So if you're not familiar with Blogdown, Blogdown is a newer R package that lets you create a website, in fact, more accurately, a blog type website directly from R itself via R Markdown. And when I first saw, heard of Blogdown, which was about this time last year at the 2017 Art Studio Conf, I was ecstatic. Like I saw the potential of this and the very first application I thought of was to revamp the R Podcast website itself. So I've actually written a pretty detailed article about my journey to using Blogdown that I'll put a link to in the show notes for this episode. I wanted to give you a couple highlights right here before we turn it over to our interview. I've had mostly great success with using Blogdown with the R Podcast site, and if you haven't been there lately, it definitely looks a lot different in terms of my site from say a year or year and a half ago. I think it looks much more streamlined and it carries out the vision that I'd always intended for the R Podcast site. The best part about this is that with very little customization needed, I've been able to convert my entire web publishing workflow to using Blogdown itself. So the site's been organized somewhat similarly to the previous version but at the top of the site, you'll see links to more, a, more um, description about the R podcast itself, as well as a nice little contact form that's simply an HTML widget. But again, blog down and R markdown makes it so easy to embed those. And then at the top of the page, after the header bar, you'll see we always show the latest episode at the top. And in the past, I would always show just like a little audio player but I decided to get a little fancy for the for the revamp of the site, and now we show a little video, albeit it's sim- simply a nice little background, but with some visualization of the sound waves embedded in the, in the middle there. And I'm still kind of working through the kinks on this, but I figured it would be good to have a presence on YouTube in case people are using that to discover their favorite you know media content. Um, so each episode will have a detailed, you know, set of show notes, just like before. And each episode page also has a contact, um, you know, discuss type of comment system. So you're welcome to leave your comments there. And I'll remind you of that at the end of the episode. But some other nice little features that came with blog down and more specifically the theme that I'm using for this um, site, which actually is a theme dedicated to podcasts themselves. I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Matt Stratton, who runs the Arrested DevOps podcast for making this theme, which of course is based on the Hugo engine that Blogdown is wrapping. So one of the features he implemented is a way for you to simply have, if you ever have interviews for an episode, to put guests on that same show notes page. So I just took it one step further. So at the top of the web page, you'll see um, a link called Guest. And when you click on that, you will see a a quick listing 
of every guest that's been on uh, that I've been fortunate enough to talk to on the R podcast. So if you ever want to interested in reading more about their information, maybe get some links to their GitHub profiles, etc. I'd invite you to check that part of the site out. I'm, I'm pretty proud of it and I'm hoping to obviously add more as time goes on. Lastly, there are links at the top for assembled resources that I mostly carried over from the previous version, as well as a detailed page for how you can subscribe to new episodes. So admittedly, this has been a brief overview of the site itself, but I'm really excited about how it looks and the initial feedback has been quite positive. But again, my site is just one small example of what's possible when you utilize Blogdown to create a website entirely from our Markdown files. So I think that's a great segue to let's dive into my interview at our studio conf with Ihue Sia. Hello, everybody. Our, our coverage of our Studio Conf 2018 continues, and it is my big pleasure to welcome the first ever guest on the R Podcast. We are together again many years later, but it's my pleasure to welcome Ihui Sia to the show. Thanks, Ihui, for joining me. Um, thanks, Eric, for the invite. Absolutely. So. A lot's been happened since the last time you went on the show, which yeah. um, was about almost five years ago. I, I looked just this morning. Yeah. Um, since that time, you've become a software engineer at our studio. Mm -hmm. And from what I can tell, it's been quite successful. Mm -hmm. But um, in, in your, has the role been everything you thought it would be? What were your thoughts on that? Uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's been quite a while since we talked last time. So. Uh, the reason that I accepted your invite to do this interview was uh, primarily because uh, I think it's uh, it's a good it's a good idea to uh, summarize uh, uh, this five years. So well, so uh, in terms in terms of uh, my current role at, at our studio, uh, I think um, currently I, I'm I'm completely satisfied with uh, what I have been doing and satisfied with my my role at our studio. But uh, I, I think I, I have more stories to tell. So pre uh, basically, so I believe pretty much everyone uh, in this world has a bright side and dark side. And, but not many people actually know the dark side of other people. So I, 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 want, to show, I want to share some of the, uh, some stories uh, on the dark side of me. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. From so, from your perspective, you you may you might feel that I have been very successful, but oh, um, yeah. So over the five years I have been working at our studio, I did get something done. For, so, for example, when I first joined our studio in uh, 2013, so I was assigned to the Shiny team, and I added I added a few things to uh, to Shiny. For example, the Data tables and uh, select uh, se selectize .js. So that was in uh, yeah, 2013, and then uh, from 2014, I started work. I started working on uh, a package named DT, which is uh, uh, an interface to the JavaScript library named uh, Data Tables. So then in 2015, I spent a fair amount of time on an R package named Leaflet, which was originally created by uh, Joe, Joe Cheng. Mm -hmm. So I, I took on his work and I worked, uh, so th that, that was pretty much my 2015. And at that, at that point, I, I had been primarily working on uh, JavaScript applications. So um, I was definitely not a JavaScript professional. I kind of enjoyed hacking with JavaScript, but I was obviously not passionate enough about my job at that time. So now here comes my dark side. <laughs> so due to several reasons, including that um, I was not super passionate about uh, JavaScript and I w uh, the, the more important reason was that I was very poor at uh, interpersonal communication. So I started to put aside my official job and pro uh, procrastinated frequently and sometimes even disappeared from the team. Uh, so as time went by, it became a very serious uh, internal crisis of mine. So basically in 2014 and 2015, 
I constantly uh, felt depressed. So it, it, it's probably very hard for you to imagine <laughs> the amount of like depression, anxiety, shame, and even guilt. So I, I, will, I, will, I will write a, a long blog post on this matter, maybe uh, in, in the near future. I think it's worthwhile sharing the, this experience with, uh, with other people. For now, I just want to say that, that that was completely my own fault. So there's no one else to blame. So I learned, uh, quite, I learned some very bitter lessons. So, I, so basically, I joined a dream company, but I, I kind of... Uh, Ruined, ruined myself in the in the very beginning. So it took me quite a while to recover from my early career uh, crisis. But things got better in uh, 2016, fortunately. So from 2016, I started to recover, um, and the reason for that was um, I I started working on the book down package, mm -hmm. and I was extremely excited about that because I really, really love writing things like writing books or writing blog posts. So, so basically my personal interest and the interest of the company, finally, they were finally aligned. So I was highly motivated. And then last year, 26, uh, 2017, it was very similar. I worked on the blog down package and I absolutely uh, love writing and I really wish to improve the tools for writing no matter it's like writing writing a book or writing a, a website so just, yeah just to answer your very initial question sorry i just uh, went went a long way so to answer your initial question yeah i so for now i'm very satisfied with my role uh, in this company that was amazing. I fully appreciate your candor on this. I certainly was not expecting that, but, <laughs> but this is why I like talking to people, especially people like you that I've met obviously multiple times. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy hearing the personal side of, mm -hmm. you know, we, we see the end products of this. We see you make knitter. We see you, like yep. you said, work on DT. Yep. We don't always know the backstory in between these things. Right. And we're, we're all human beings. We're not machines. Right. Exactly. And it's really, it's it's humbling to get the personal side of it mm -hmm. and i think all of us have had these experiences gosh i sure have in my career i've had situations where i was in a you know not the best role or not mm -hmm. the best place and mm -hmm. i had to find ways to turn it around but i, I definitely commend you for finding <laughs> finding the bright side after yeah. those dark periods it's yeah, yeah. been very interesting mm -hmm. yeah so I'm, I'm definitely going to talk about blog down um in a little bit but i I definitely value the all obviously the work you've done with Knitter. That was like the start of all this journey of reproducible research. And mm -hmm. our markdown to me, I mean, I realize JJ has been, you know, helping with developing that. Yep. I feel like that's become almost its own R ecosystem with powerful frameworks, extensions. We can now create interactive reports. We'll, we'll talk about entire websites mm -hmm. and blogs. Um, just before we get to some of those, you know, extensions. What do you think is next in like the continuing evolution of our markdown in your mm -hmm, opinion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's a very natural question. So at this point, so basically with our markdown, you can compile like single documents to reports, you can make slides, you can create dashboards, you can uh, build interactive applications, you can write journal papers, author books and generate websites. So yeah, this does sound like uh, an amazing ecosystem and personally I'm very very proud of it although I definitely should not take all the credit so for example the R markdown was primarily uh, written by JJ and for, for my own credit I, I can only take the credit for for the book down package and the blog down package so yeah it's it's very natural to ask the question what's next so but unfortunately I, I don't have a very clear ad idea at the moment I do have something to do in the next in the next couple of months, but I'd rather not talk about it. It's not because it's it's a secret. But it's because it's it's mainly because I usually don't want to make promises too early. So yeah, in terms of things to, to do in the even farther uh, future, I think there's still quite a bit of work to do uh, to make our markdown work seamlessly uh, with journals. To, I mean, to write journal papers. So currently we, ha we, we do have a package named articles, uh, articles without the, the leading A, only R and Ticos. 
So we have an, an articles package, but honestly, I don't think um, it has, I don't think it, it has uh, fully met the standards of um, journals yet. So the other thing I'm very interested in uh, doing is to uh, build books from blog posts that I'm, I'm very interested in that. So it's kind of like a combination of blog down and book down. So, you know, currently book down is primarily for books and blog down is only for like blog posts and websites. But I want to, I want a way to like, uh, to compile a book from uh, several blog posts. I think it will be very useful and it may generate a lot of uh, new books from the R community or from the Stast community if you write blogs. So I, I wonder, have you ever heard of the book Rework? No, the, I haven't. Yeah, Rework. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a business book. Okay. So that book, that was one, uh, I think it was a bestseller in, I don't know, 2011 or 2012. Yeah, that, that book was actually compiled from blog posts from its authors. And yeah, so I think I, if I remember the names correctly, the authors were Jason Fried and there's another famous guy. I only rem remember uh, his initials, DHH. Uh, I think he, yeah, he's, in the, uh, he's in the Ruby community. Okay, so we'll put it in the yeah, show notes for yeah, sure. Yeah, DHH. Yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, I, I, I also want to make uh, some other comments uh, on R Markdown. So I, I think probably many people don't understand why. Uh, they don't understand the point of, R, uh, of Markdown or R Markdown, especially those LaTeX users. You know, They don't understand why we invest so much time and effort in such a simple and weak language. It's just so simple, right? But my philosophy is that the pursuit of the pursuit of features can sometimes uh, be harmful for both software developers and users. Mm -hmm. So you may spend just too much time on features of software instead of getting the work done. So sometimes you may even forget what, what you actually need to do. So for example, you need to write the paper, you need to write the book, but oftentimes you are, you are just spending time on like tweaking the margins, the font, and things like that. So the weakness of Markdown, in my eyes, is actually a good feature mm -hmm. it's because it forces you forces you to focus on the content, and more importantly, it makes you it makes your content portable just because uh, because of its simplicity. So, for example, you can generate PDF documents, HTML, and Word documents, and many other formats from Markdown. I I, I don't think this is, this would be possible with other languages like LaTeX or HTML. So anyway, so I have my own uh, strong faith in the R Markdown ecosystem. So I think it will save users a lot of time and make them productive. So I will certainly keep working on this ecosystem until, uh, until it is relatively complete. Yeah. Well, I must say, I, it didn't take very much to convince me to go to R Markdown in general because we, many of us that have graduated with, like, say, a master's or a PhD, we had to write a thesis in LaTeX mm -hmm. and meet standards that the mm -hmm. department needed. And I spent way too much time on those details. I just <laughs> wanted to write it, get it done, graduate, move mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, I love how Markdown just lets me concentrate on the content mm -hmm. and not the, the frivolous stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to mention, and, and frankly, I want to thank you for working on Blogdown because what, what I, I have, a, I've said this in the previous part of the episode, my website is now based in Hugo and Blogdown mm -hmm. and it is everything I've envisioned it ever to be. You've given cool. me, I, it, I don't need WordPress, I don't need that other static site generators in Python, this is the one for me. So what I, I, I know a little bit of the backstory how <laughs> Blogdown started, but I, I'm just, again, thank you for for making that. I've been a really, really uh, early adopter of it and mm -hmm. I'm glad to see it mature as it has. So my question to you about this is that I've sensed that Blogdown has had its own unique challenges along mm -hmm. the way, but has it been any easier or harder than your work on say Knitter and, and what you have done with our Markdown and Bookdown? What have been some of the, the challenges or that you've had to encounter there? Yeah, in ter uh, for Blockdown, I think it's um, 
in terms of uh, programming, I think it, uh, block lines was much easier to develop than other packages like Knitter and R Markdown. So just to give you a, a rough idea, the, the total number of lines of source code in Blockdown was, I think it was un, under uh, 2,000, 2,000 lines. And for Knitter, the, the, the total number of lines for, of the source code was uh, about 8,500. Wow. So yeah, so the, the challenge, the main challenge for Blockdown didn't came from uh, the programming side. The major challenge was um, about the user interface. Yeah, basically, I, I want users to be able to create their websites as smoothly as possible. So that's why I spend a lot of time talking to, especially talking to beginners. I want to see uh, what what their obstacle obstacles are. So I want to see the, all the possible ways that it, they can get stuck so I can fix these things from uh, uh, in, in the code. The other major challenge uh, in developing Blockdown was actually the documentation. You probably can't imagine how, how much time I spent on the documentation. Uh, but I mean, the primarily, uh, I mean, the, the Blockdown book. Yes, right. Yeah, so I spent a huge amount of time on that book. And there were, yeah, uh, as I told you, I, I actually enjoy uh, writing books, but sometimes, it, yeah, very occasionally, it's really, really painful. <laughs> so, for example, in the, in the, in the Blockdown book, there were uh, two parts that were, uh, were particularly painful to me, and one part was the chapter two on Hugo. Oh, yes. You know, Hugo is a huge system. It's, it's really hard to cover all the things in a single chapter. There are just so many things that you can do with Hugo. So the, the, the challenge is that how you can properly summarize all these things in a single chapter. You have to remove certain things. You, there's no way that you can cover everything. So the, the, the challenge is to how to select the topics that are um, uh, that, that are good enough to get people started with uh, Blockdown. The other difficult part was the appendix. Yeah, there are just so many gory details in, uh, <laughs> in, uh, in like building websites. Like you have to know a little bit about like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, in, and even those like domain names, and DNS records. Yeah, there's just so, so many things to, uh, to talk about. So I put them in the appendix. So I'm, I'm not sure if the appendix will actually be helpful to beginners, but I, I tried my best. Oh, actually, so this book was uh, co-authored with uh, Amber Thomas and Alison Hill, and they were extremely helpful. Uh, in particular, they, they, the, 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 the reason that I, I asked them to co-author this book was actually not because of their, like, um, uh, uh, it's not. It's not because of technical reasons. I mean, I I, I don't care about the technical skills of other people uh, of them. Uh, what I cared most ab about them was that they they were able to think from the perspective of, of beginners. They care a lot about uh, beginners. So that is what I really need. Uh, th that's the most um, valuable input I need from them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, the, I've been, it's an excellent book. In fact, I got my printed copy a couple of weeks ago, and mm -hmm. I've been looking at it to make sure my website's being maintained correctly. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting about the book is that this isn't the first time you've done this, but you, you have, of course, a printed version, but mm -hmm. there's also the version online. Yes. Free of charge and freely available, and it's written in book down, of course. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess my question about this is that do you sense that this model of writing a book in the open and mm -hmm. then i think it was mid midway through your writing of the book that you recruited your mm -hmm. co-authors of this mm -hmm. but do you think this is kind of a viable model for others in the art community that have an idea about maybe publishing a book that started in the open and maybe mm -hmm. getting a publisher later on how, how do you yeah, feel about that yeah honestly i don't i don't have an answer but i i think it's 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 up to the it's mainly up to the publisher. So for me, I was fortunate enough to work with my editor John Kimmel from Chapman Hall, and they were generous enough to uh, allow me to um, put the book online for free. And w so basically, when I worked with them, 
all they asked from me was the the right to print the book and sell the book. So that that's all, all they need they needed. So on my side, I can still put the book online for free for free. It's just I I uh, yeah. They they only need to they only need the right to uh, print and sell the book. So actually, when, as you are, as you brought up this topic, I uh, I also want to to talk about a little bit about the the like the free content, free books, free papers. That's I'm not right. sure. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I I have heard many many people um, uh, talking about this. So basically, a lot of people, especially in the academia. They they just think all oh, the the books and papers they just they just should be free, and I I, I personally I feel that that's not quite right. So I think there probably there's a kind of a prejudice in the academia against commercial companies like the publishers. My my feeling is that you have to consider the work behind the publications. You don't you don't you you shouldn't just say oh your paper should be free your book should be free there's nothing that should be free you have to consider the work behind them yeah because it yeah. doesn't just magically appear right right there's, right there's a process behind yeah you this. have yeah you have to consider like the employees of these uh, commercial companies the publishers the, so the, the the like for example the copy editors they have they have done the work they they also need to survive they they probably have like families to support they need to be paid so. There's nothing that should be free. I mean, right? So, if if something, uh, so, uh, so for for me, I the reason that I can make my books free is because I don't I don't really need the money. I don't need I don't really need the royalties. So because uh, thanks to my employer, Art Studio, they paid me really well. So I don't I don't really just need the royalties. So that's why I just waived the royalties and. Yeah, it's primarily because I can afford it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, you're right. I I hear that a lot too. It's like there's that kind of this this um, almost distorted view of everything should be free, everything should be open, and yeah, there's yeah. a balance there. But at the same right. time, we we all have our responsibilities. We all have to you know provide for mm -hmm. family or etc. So mm -hmm. it can't just be one extreme or the other. You can't have everything all closed either. But there's mm -hmm. there's a happy medium in there somewhere. So right. that's a very interesting perspective on that. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, as, as you alluded to earlier in our in our talk. You obviously have worked on other packages outside of our markdown type packages in the past, such as DT for the data tables. Mm -hmm. And you've you've written, you, and I've always been, enjoyed reading your blog posts. They're always mm -hmm. very powerful, <laughs> very interesting reads. I mean, you've mentioned, and I'm paraphrasing here, that you can have a difficult time jumping from one relatively large project to another. Mm -hmm. And I can completely relate because. In my daily work, I worked on a shiny app for like a year and a half, almost two years. It consumed a lot of my daily job, and then now I have to shift to something else entirely, and it's sometimes difficult to balance that. So I guess um, my question is, do you have any tips that you've learned on how you balance like the development and ma maintenance of projects mm -hmm. that can have fundamentally different you know backends purposes or mm -hmm. heck code bases mm -hmm. i don't know if you have thoughts on that yeah uh, this is a really hard question for me <laughs> yeah I, I still i still have to figure out a proper uh, solution so i think it's uh, it's it's essentially a question about or it's more a question about psychology i mean it happens that I'm, extre I'm extremely interested in psychology, and sometimes I think I'm relatively good at uh, applying psych psychological methods to other people. But ironically, I'm very poor at dealing myself. For example, it's very hard for me to to mot motivate myself to switch to a different project. So the hardest part of switching to a different project is I think it's the the very initial psychological friction so I when, once you've got a new project or a different project to, to work on you just want to step back oh, I don't want to get started yeah, yeah for this reason for that reason yeah so uh, but I, I think once you once you get past that stage things will be a lot easier once you really once you just once you get started with that project, I think you you will just keep going. So I think I think most people understand this. However, not many people really 
have the willpower to overcome the initial friction. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's like doing physical exercises. You know, it, it'll be good for your for your health, but you just hate it every time. Right? <laughs> right, you just right. don't want to go to the gym. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Once you go there, you may just yeah, I will just do the exercises. But sure. well, yeah, when you are, when you stay at home, think and thinking about doing the exercises, ah, oh, I just don't want to go there. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I know that exact feeling. There are things that I know I need to attend to, and I just it's hard to motivate myself to do it. So it, yeah. it's it's definitely difficult. Um, mm -hmm. So I mean, the getting back to kind of more of a meta type topic. I mean. Mm -hmm. You and I both have, you know, families to, to help, you know, take care of. Um, yeah. I've always admired how you approach your work. I don't know if you have tips, whether it's even just for me or for the other listeners, on mm -hmm. how, what do you do for achieving a good work-life balance? What are some of the things that work for you? Uh huh. Yeah, again, I think you've, you've all got another really, really hard question <laughs> for me. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so... I think, uh, although I, I can probably provide uh, an answer, but I'm afraid um, I'm not a very representative sample due to my very distinctive personality. So what I'm going to say probably won't apply to other people in the art community. So um, first of all, I, I, I don't think, I don't feel there's a very clear border between work and life. So. Yeah, the work, the work and life balance problem is is probably a, a different pro problem to me. Okay. So I, for, for example, I constantly work in late nights and even over weekends. So whenever I've got a chance, so by getting a chance now, you you know, by getting a chance, that means the little ones are not crying. They are not like pulling my legs <laughs> and calling for my attention. <laughs> so secondly, I, I, I don't think, uh, so I, I don't have, Maybe it's fortunate. I don't have a lot of personal hobbies. For example, I don't play computer games, but I do have a few effective hobbies that can help me calm down and enjoy life. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you that I only have four personal hobbies. Number one, badminton. Number two, cooking. Number three, reading. And number four, writing. And that's all. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so yeah, I, I actually... Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's pretty much what I have. Yeah. But, that's, but, that's, <laughs> uh, but the, the point is, is that you don't necessarily have to do so many different things to achieve that balance. Right. It's like some things that you're motivated to kind of get away from like the coding and, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the work type activities, mm -hmm. but just making sure you prioritize that mm -hmm. instead of just doing extremely all work all the time. Right. Make sure you take time for yourself. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Know, sometimes when you focus on a project, it's easy just to forget the other stuff. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I want to add to the uh, work and life balance problem is that I, I really want to emphasize the importance of uh, the importance of a health body. I, I guess that's everybody knows that. But uh, yeah, you 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 must have heard of this many many times before. But I still want to emphasize that don't don't exchange your health with other things such as wealth or fame or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So for me, like when, whenever I feel sleepy, I will just go to sleep. I, I don't think I don't worry about the work. Yeah, yeah I think this is it. I should I, I should thank our studio again for the flexibility uh, in my work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's that's a good point, though, because yeah. And let, I mean, it, your your health is usually the most important thing. Yeah, you need to take time for yourself, right. and that's certainly sage advice. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, um, as you've heard in a lot of the talks here, you know, we'll get back to blog down a little bit. It's is making data scientists, statisticians much easier to create an online presence, mm -hmm. especially just from R itself and mm -hmm. just knowing our, our markdown. You you can be set up in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, now I've. I've really admired the fact that alongside releasing Blog Down, you've actually founded a very interesting effort mm -hmm. to, called R Bind. I don't know if you want to tell the listeners a bit about this and how it might help them get started. Yeah, sure. So R Bind is uh, it is a GitHub organization. So if you want to uh, take a look at that, you can go to the uh, uh, you can go to GitHub.com/rbind. So obviously the, the name of this organization uh, came from the R function, R bind, right? <laughs> there's, there's a function R bind and C bind in, in, in base R. So the goal of this organization uh, was to like 
find all websites related to R computing and statistics to a single place, to a single organization, so that, for example, everybody can uh, uh, put his or her uh, rep repository of their websites uh, in this single organization, so that in the future, if anyone else is interested in building a website, they can just come to this organization and see Ah, they, they, maybe they can see. Oh, this this website looks beautiful and interesting. How 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 did the author made it? So they can just uh, open the the repository and figure out. Oh, well, what what's the theme he or she was using, and how yeah, what what are the like, the scripts that uh, the the author used, uh, like JavaScript or CSS themes? They can study the 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 source of the theme. So I think that's kind of uh, like the the spirit of open source, right? So I I I um I went to a talk by uh, Richard Stallman uh, a number of years ago I think in 2012 I believe so where he 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 talked about the spirit of open source so I I very much appreciate the uh, one aspect of uh, open source and free uh, software uh, which is uh, that. W the the free, the open source software gives you the freedom to like study the the source code of uh, the software. So similarly, I want Rbind to achieve this the the same goal. So once you've seen a beautiful website, you will have the freedom to study how it was uh, built. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I've been I've really admired the effort. And um, another thing that happened as you first launched is you asked a few of those that were using blog down to kind of write about their experience and about mm -hmm. giving a summary of their site mm -hmm. and i'll put a link to the article that i wrote about my site and just mm -hmm. again illustrating what it gave to me mm -hmm. but again it's it's like you said it's giving in that open source uh, philosophy mm -hmm. someone's interested and they want to see what others have done it's fully transparent mm -hmm. you can look at the code you can look at the structure mm -hmm. and it gives you a lot of great ideas mm -hmm. so i'm Again, I want to thank you for that, and I hope we can keep that going, mm -hmm. you know, for for the long term, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, before I forget, I, 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 I another thing just came to my mind. If, uh, yeah, the list, uh, if you are listening to this podcast, please don't study the source code of my website <laughs> as <laughs> as the first repository, it's because I'm I am the author of Blogdown, and the setup of my website. It, I think it's very complicated. It's not a good example for uh, beginners. <laughs> so look at the source code of other people's websites first. Don't, don't look at look at mine. <laughs> yeah, and maybe to a lesser degree, they probably shouldn't look at mine first either because I have to do the media stuff and all that. Although it is mm -hmm. a theme that controls all that. But we have many other examples that are right. much more basic than what you and I right, are, are right. doing. So, but there's a wide selection there. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad we could we could mention that. So. Obviously, Eway, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Um, mm -hmm. if, if our listeners want to get in touch with you or figure out, follow what you're doing, or if you want to tell them anything else before we sign off. Um, I don't have anything else on my mind right now. Cool. Yeah. So is the best place to reach you is on your um, GitHub profile? Yeah, or? GitHub or okay. my personal website. Yes, yeah. we'll put a link to that in the show notes, too. It's an yeah. excellent site. I yeah. really Thank admire your post lately. Very <laughs> thought-provoking. Thank you. So. Yeah, again, thanks a lot for joining me, and um, we'll definitely be in touch. Okay, my pleasure. All Thank right. you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll be back right after this. Okay. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ihui, and I'll be honest, that was mind-blowing to me at how candid he was to talk about his experiences and i am just amazed in fact actually that's what i want to talk about when he first show, shared his story about um you know the the difficulties he had in adjusting to his initial assignments you know working at our studio i admit i had a in my now that i listen back to it i had a pretty bad choice of words like it's never quote amazing to hear somebody go through such trouble and, and turmoil in their life what i was trying to to convey is that Iwe always speaks in such powerful ways when he decides to either make a post on his site or fortunately for me to talk to me on the podcast. And frankly, I was just 
it was a very impactful story to me. And that's what I was, you know, expressing my emotion about. So I certainly hope none of you took it the wrong way. And I think anyway, way you understand my my reaction to that it was just I was shocked at what I was hearing. But again, this is the kind of stuff that really I love to connect with people about is that we all have had, you know, various trials and tribulations along our our paths in life or career or, or a mix of both. And so I really appreciate Ihue's um, candid, candid explanation. And it's not easy to share those kind of things. And in fact, Ihue has pu published a, a post on his blog detailing more about his learning and his experience. So we'll have, we'll have that link in the show notes as well. So other, you know, tidbits about that, about that um, interview I wanted to emphasize is, you know, blog down itself, again, makes it very easy for anybody in the art community to make a website entirely in our markdown. And if you're ever having questions about how do I actually publish this or getting a platform to publish on, I'll remind you again, I would definitely check out the Rbind organization on GitHub. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. I'm a very small you know, role in volunteering to help um, administer some of the issues uh, as far as people are getting on boarded. But I really enjoy that service and I think it's a it's a valuable resource for people. So I really um, am intrigued by Ihue's uh, summary about how we can have a more robust pipeline of once somebody creates a very nice, say, blog down site, maybe a series of posts about a dedicated topic, to ease that transition into possibly publishing a online version or even perhaps even a printed version of a of an actual textbook. I think that's that's got a lot of potential. And of course, I'm very curious what project he's working on. He did not give me any hints after the mics were off, but I will I will be uh, watching along with all of you to keep up with that. And then one other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, Mara Averick, who now works at our studio, put together a really nice uh, roundup of resources around Blogdown that are a great companion to the online uh, textbook and printed textbook that Ihue has authored that he talked about in the interview. So I'll, I would definitely invite you to check that out as well. Okay, well, I think that will wrap up this particular episode. We'll be back with my last interview from our studio comp in the next episode, along with all of my key insights and takeaways from our studio comp. So I hope you enjoyed listening. And if you want to learn more about the R podcast, I definitely invite you to check out our, again, brand new looking website at r-podcast.org. We are in iTunes, at least I believe we are. Um, if you like the if you like the content, I mean, I don't usually ask this, but if you could leave a, a nice review about your thoughts on the podcast, I would greatly appreciate it. In fact, it's probably not even called iTunes anymore. It's called like the Apple Podcast Store or something. Anyway, you know how to find it. Um, we are on uh, Pocket Cast as well. And um, I'm looking to expand the, the outreach into other platforms as well. So I definitely appreciate the feedback I've been getting around those things. Um, if you want to leave a comment about this episode, go ahead and go to the episode 24 page on the website. You can leave a comment in the Discus uh, forum or comment system there. We also have the contact page. If you'd like to send me a quick message, you don't have to do anything else. Just go to r-podcast.org slash contact and fill out the very simple uh, contact form there. So I really appreciate the feedback. And it's, again, been great to give you some interesting conversations from the R Studio Conf floor. So that's going to wrap up this episode 24. Until next time. End of line. <laughs>